Hi, everyone. Um, and welcome to this, uh, our fourth debate in the LIDC uh, Guardian series. Uh, today we're talking about does short-term volunteering do abroad do more harm than good? And I'm Claire Heffernan. I'm the director of LIDC. And we've been really overwhelmed by the interest in this event. There's been a really large wait list, and people have been calling us all day to come. So we're delighted that you're here now. Um, so just, and there'll be drinks, of course, after the event on the ground floor, and just a few housekeeping details. Um, the fire exit, there's four fire exits. The toilets are also on the ground floor. And now I'd like to hand you over to my counterpart from The Guardian, Bibi van der Zee. Welcome, Bibi. Hello. Hello, everyone. So I am Bibi van der Zee. I'm an editor and writer on the Global Development Desk at The Guardian. And this is a subject which we've covered on and off over the years. It always generates a lot of debate and argument. I mean, for very clear reasons, people feel very, very, very passionate about it on both sides of the debate. I just wanted to ask before we started, how many, maybe if you could give a show of hands, if you have volunteered overseas. Do you want to just put your hand up? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, that answers that question. So, wonderful. Well, uh, so we're gonna, we've got a, a brilliant panel. They're going to talk briefly about their point of view and where they're coming from on the subject. And then, as quickly as possible, we're gonna turn it over to you for your questions so that you can grill everybody and put your point of view as well on this issue. Um, uh, so we're gonna start off with, oh, sorry, I've got the people the wrong way around. We've got a start, a start we started with Alex Kent from Restless Development, which is a youth-led development agency that sends volunteers works with volunteers in the UK and overseas. So she's going to get us started, Alex. Thanks. Can you hear me OK? Um, yeah, what's the microphone? microphone? I don't know. <laughs> Can you hear me <coughs> back? Yeah? Fine, OK. Um, so I'm Alex Kent. So I work for Restless Development. Um, we're a youth-led agency, and we work with about 5,000 young leaders or volunteers for the sake of this debate um, every year. And most of those are in country. and. Um, so most of those are in country, uh, national, and, and also from their Is communities. It no, it's, it's not on. It's not on. Hello. <laughs> so I work for Restless Development. We're a youth-led agency. We work um, with about 5,000 young leaders every year. Um, well, for the sake of this debate, uh, volunteers. Most of those are in country and, and in their own communities, and about 500 of those are volunteers that we send overseas with, with ICS. Um, so. I, I see the world that's increasingly affected by global poverty, um, growing inequality, climate change, uh, unemployment, other big global issues, refugees and migration. And I see a world, especially in the UK and in, in the West, which is increasingly cares about localised issues, whether that be um, the war going, Donald Trump's war, whether that be Brexit, whether that be um, also, uh, immigration bans and, and so on. Um, and, and here in the UK, we care less about global poverty than we, ha we did five, ten years ago. Global, the polls show that actually we, that's decreased by at least 50%. I'm not really surprised for many, re for many reasons, increasing. We've decreased our spend on development education and lots of other reasons. Um, but I also believe that young people that I've worked with both in restless development in the UK and globally care passionately about making the world a better place, that they want to see sustainable um, change and, and, for a just and, and for a just and fairer world. Um, and I see volunteering, as we see it in terms of global um, youth leaders, essential in creating a more active global citizens and connecting them and connecting them to make greater change. Um, yeah, young people that I work with every day, be that the UK, South Africa, Nepal, are often affected by the same issues, whether that's in employment, uh, sexual rights, gender violence, or feeling like their governments are not listening to them. Um, and where we've been able to connect volunteers with programmes such as ICS, they've been able to actually challenge themselves and, and gain confidence, gain leadership skills, but also grow a movement of people that are able to drive better development, um, better long-lasting change and have a, a much 
bigger global impact. So that's my, uh, there's lots of other details I can go on to, I'm sure I will in the questions as well, about challenging some of the stereotypes. ICS is, isn't about volunteerism, there's nothing touristic about it, it's not about the commodi mod commodification of poverty. Um, it is about a long-term sustainable change, starting with a young person, and that connection, it's both about an international volunteer, but it's also about a national volunteer, and that volunteer being led in the community. Um, so I'll leave it there, because I'm sure we'll come on to it in questions. Thank you, Alex. Um, next is Dr. Jim Butcher from Canterbury Christ University, and he is the author of a recent book called Volunteer Tourism, The Lifestyle Politics of International Development. Dr. Butcher. Uh, thanks, Bibi. OK, to begin with, the first thing I would argue is that um, volunteer tourism short-term projects abroad, okay, they kind of merge into each other in, in, in my opinion, but I don't see them as, uh, as the kind of problem that some people do. I had a little review of the last few years' press coverage uh, of these kind of things, and there were plenty of articles referring to uh, a kind of neo-colonial mindset, white saviour complex, white privilege, out for yourself. Frankly, there was a great deal of cynicism about the kind of motives of, of the young people who travelled abroad ostensibly to try and help people in, in, the way that, that, in the way that you're suggesting. And I don't hold with that. I think that, uh, and I was talking to some of my students about, about this just yesterday to try and get the lie of the land and how they, how they saw this really. Really what motivates it is a certain kind of altruism and a private project, a project of the self in a way, rather than a public political project to make a difference in the world. It's not really development politics we're talking here ver about here very often. It's much more a kind of private desire to help, to care, when other channels seem rather distant, political, corrupt, and beyond, uh, beyond the individual. In fact, if anything, I'm quite for people being more experimental about how they travel. I don't know if you know this, but this month it's the 60th, 60th anniversary of the release of On the Road. There's a whole different, you know, a different culture of travel right there that emphasises do what you want, see what you want, learn what you want to learn, meet the world head on rather than going with some kind of idea that you're going to help these people and become a global citizen. However, whilst I don't think uh, you know, short-term volunteering is, is the problem per se, neither do I think it's a solution for development. Development politics should be public, contested, big, transformative, future-oriented, and I don't think the discussions, uh, it, 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 insofar as short-term volunteering fits a development narrative, it tends to be a kind of limited, localised, neo-populist neo uh, vision uh, at best. And just very, very finally, to illustrate that, think about who is contributing to development and who we should talk about with regard to development. Is it 100,000 um, short-term development volunteers doing good things in villages, teaching, helping in orphanages, digging wells? Or is it between one and two million Chinese workers with contracts of between one and three years building roads, ports and infrastructure? Possibly the latter is the thing, in reality, that's contributing to development. Uh, but that doesn't make the former wrong. Thank you, Jim. Okay, um, next to speak is Tricia Barnett, Barnett from Equality in Tourism. And Tricia was Director of Tourism Concern for over 20 years, so this is, she is in depth in this subject. Thank you, Bibi. Hello, everyone. Um, really, really pleased to be here, but this is a debate that's been going on for such a long time. Um, and the whole ethos of development is something that's been going on, though, for far longer. And I really do believe that we have to fit short-term volunteering, or volunteerism as it really is being called, within the development paradigm. And ask the question, does the development industry, because that's what it is, as we know it, actually lead to long, positive and lasting change? You know, at school, we were asked to raise funding for water projects, and we would see pictures of women walking with buckets on their heads as they trekked to and from villages, from wells and other watercourses. Years and years later, I'm an old woman now, I still see those same pictures of people walking backwards and forwards to their village, usually women and girls, with buckets on their heads. And so I um, met with two people from a very big water development agency and asked them about this, and they said that they wanted to work for change through campaigning, but they had been told by their bosses that the public doesn't want to know about the reasons for poverty 
and shortage of water, and should they know, they would stop giving them money. Discussing this with um, anybody is very, very complex because development is complex. And I believe that volunteerism simplifies everything. It's us and them, those without money and those with. You can put any label you want on it if you don't like volunteerism, but ultimately, who are the most vulnerable? <coughs> who are the strong and who are the weak? And who gains most from it all? A few years ago in Manchester, we held a debate at Tourism Concern, pretty much the same title as this one now. We had it with students over two days, and we invited people from Africa, from different countries in Africa, <laughs> to take part in the debate. And they argued not to go, and they won the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Finally, Professor Andrew Jones of City University London, who has worked on a study for the UK government on the nature and significance of gap years. Thanks very much. Um, <coughs> so, Tricia, a little bit about me. Tricia and I know each other of old because back about 15 years ago, I was asked by the UK government to work out what gap years were. And I want to use that. <laughs> the, the minister said, we know nothing about this, and it's on the front page of the Daily Mail. Please, we need to commission some research, which started me on a journey which leads me to be sitting here in front of you now. I'm a social scientist. I'm interested in globalization. I'm interested in development. I'm interested in the nature of work. So my, my perspective is similar in some respects to Jim's, but also coming from a slightly different place. What I want to start by doing is answer the question um, in true academic fashion, does it do more harm than good? And I fall onto the side, more or less the position that Jim said, that it, it is a positive, it, and we'll come to that in a minute, is a positive thing in the world. The question though, is the terms of the debate, because I have sat in these kinds of discussions to talk about tourism, to talk about work, to talk about development, and to sort about international mobility. And we frame the things that we talk about in terms of volunteering. There is a challenge I think we could explore around what volunteering is. Uh, I, I have been engaged significantly in discussions about nature of voluntary work. If we were sitting in the United States, the conception of the thing we're talking about is rather different. There's a much different history. It isn't framed in the same kind of language about neocolonialism because there isn't that, that historical and current media baggage around the question. So the things I sort of want to throw out, in terms of thinking about this activity or phenomena in the world, we need to see it in the round. Um, and I, I, I'll illustrate that by sharing a story. In part of my research, over my, my research career, I've probably interviewed more than a thousand volunteers, at least, or in groups, in focus groups, in different developed and developing countries, because my focus wasn't necessarily within a development axis. And the, there is this fundamental question about the original objective and framing of what short-term volunteering is. Seen in the context of, as Jim said, is this a major <laughs> part of development? Has the impact been very significant? The answer through my research has always been no. But then I reflect on going to talk to the heads of secondary schools in Tanzania in a structured volunteering project who had lots of placements every year and explaining this discourse in the UK about the way this was seen. And the head said, well, you know, these people are coming here for nine months and are acting as English language assistants because we teach in Swahili and we have English as a second language. Are they contributing in a vast way to the development of Tanzania? No, not really, but then don't you have teaching language assistants in a London secondary school? And I think that illustrates one of the points about definition about what we're talking about. There are things I've been on the beach in Costa Rica with a scheme that is not, it is creating more harm than good. Too many volunteers to save the turtles, people you know, not how they've flown out to Costa Rica. That's how many carbon, how many units of carbon in the atmosphere. The scheme is not well structured. It isn't working very well. There is no structure. These people are not getting a very good experience. That that isn't a very positive experience. But taken in aggregate, if we look at current schemes, we look at what's going on across the planet. There are many well structured kinds of experiences. There could be work experiences. There could even be experiences that overlap with tourism. Um, that, that you could argue have positive impacts in a variety of ways, be they for economic in the local community or whether they are about notions of global civil society and interaction being a positive thing at the planetary scale. 
is the level of that positivity always enormous? No, not necessarily. Do negative things happen and volunteering is harmful? Yes, in some cases, in my experience, it does. But overall, I fall off the fence onto the, this is a positive thing in the world, but we need to think very carefully about what we mean by this. Short-term volunteering, is it? Uh, I'll leave you with my thought. When we wrote the report on gap years, I wrote the most ironic thing in my entire academic career where I was sitting in front of the minister and said, well, we've come up with a definition. A gap year is a period of time between three and 24 months, uh, which engages in a certain set of things. So we define a year as not a year, and that runs to the heart of some of these things. How long is that experience? How well structured is that experience? How well embedded in host users is that experience? Uh, how well conceived is the project? How all of these kinds of issues depend are contextual in terms of the type of activity that's taking place. So it's not a simple answer, but I'm sure we will explore some of these points through the debate. Thank you. So I'm going to jump in with the first question, um, because I can. Uh, so one of the things that we talk about a lot is, I mean, there's a, a growing suspicion and um, not maybe it's not even growing, maybe it's a lingering suspicion about aid and development and the entire sort of global project as in, in many countries it's increasingly seen as some sort of post-colonial soft power exercise and, and I can't help feeling that sending young often untrained you know, Europeans and Americans out to, to, to work in, to, to, to not very well, do not very good jobs of building things and not very good jobs of teaching people and you know, disrupt local economies and in some places displace jobs. Isn't that going to fuel that suspicion? I mean, is that not going to make this problem, the sort of the, the tension, those tensions worse? Who would, would you like to? Yes, I mean, I think you've answered your own question, Vivi. It's, it's, um, it, it's, it does all of those. It does all of those things. And, and you, Andrew, have just talked about Tanzania, but if you look to the Tanzanian governmental statements about um, volunteering, you'll find that they very much replicate what Bibi's just said, and so much so that they charge a thousand dollars for a visa <coughs> if you're a volunteer. If you're a business person, it's a hundred dollars. If you're a volunteer, it's a thousand. I think it pretty much states where the the that particular country is. And in my experience, because we work very hard at Tourism Concerns to set up a volunteering code of practice. And we wanted it both for volunteers so that they would know where to go to, not to be exploited and not to exploit others. And we wanted also for, for the organizations because this is a big industry. There are a lot of companies making a great deal of money out of this. And when we interviewed in the course of our research and our publication on this, when we interviewed people at the receiving end, we found out that very much it was very much true that hosts received very, very little money for housing, supporting, feeding, and being with the volunteers. Very, very little money. So if a volunteer, say, paid a thousand quid just out of every thousand, I'm talking about per thousand, out of every thousand pounds, and they had to work maybe with friends and neighbors to raise that money, very, very little money actually went back into the community. Minuscule. Very often, projects were repeated over and over and over again. Very often, people were sent into schools who had zero experience, and I even had somebody's, I know, a good friend's daughter arriving with her group at a school, and all the teachers left. They could see it as their chance of having a holiday. And these people who had zero experience at teaching, this was in uh, a South African township, these people who had zero experience of teaching were suddenly landed with a whole school. Alex. I can tell you so many stories but not now you can talk to me afterwards <laughs> very few of them are positive very the exploitation in orphanages i'm an ex-social worker the vulnerability of some of those people that that these uh, all of us whatever age we are we don't have to be young going out go out when we haven't had criminal record bureau checks when we actually think that we're really engaging with one young children or vulnerable people or even older children form relationships and go, and the child is left, form relationships, go, the child is left, just think what that does to a child. Not just in orphanages, but in street children and all manner of vulnerable people. And we have the, this belief that we're doing something good. I believe in our intentions, but my goodness, we need a huge amount of preparation before we set out and do this. 
Alex, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I mean, obviously, to agree with that, yeah, absolutely, in terms of good quality volunteering, you need to have, like, decent policies and programmes and, and training and safeguarding and all of that in place. But just to kind of come back to your question as well about, you know, in terms of UK aid, if you think about, I guess, a short-term placement of maybe three months in terms of a log frame and the development impact um, indicators that you can make within those three months, um, no, sure. I mean, you could do lots of other things, but I think to do that is also missing the point. And I think the point is that actually our development, the way that we do development, especially led from the UK, is flawed. I think the way that, you know, if that is seeing, looking at it in terms of uh, a log frame, um, indicators which are driven by just those specific indicators in that time frame, driven by those individuals, is actually missing a huge, the point and a and huge amount of the potential. Um, and so much of the, the, the volunteering in terms of increasing capacity, increasing leadership skills, confidence, networks, the ability to ultimately do much more for your community, led by the community, led by people who have their own primary concerns and go on to, to do much more is, is, um, is huge. And I, and I think in terms of the kind of question about is that taking away jobs, I mean, the volunteering that we do, there aren't jobs to be taken away. The, the kind of things that you're talking about is young people going into schools and talking about um, how do you protect yourself, how do you have safer sex, having gender clubs, um, having really honest and open debates about gender, about sexuality, um, starting up climate change, environmental clubs. They're, they're not physical, tangible jobs that they're taking away, but they end up both in terms of enabling those young people in their own leadership capacity, um, increasing their confidence and what they go on to do, but also a much wider network that ultimately kind of drives community, community-led um, change on a much bigger, hopefully profound scale. Yes, please. Um, yeah, can, we, can I just come on that, in on that, in the sense that, you see, I agree with <laughs> Tricia as well as in relation to what I said and one of the things I think we we should identify and point to are, are questions of scale I would say this I'm a geographer but the, it, it's a question of if this question on the board were does short-term volunteerism often do more harm than good I think I agree with that which is much um, or oh, there are certainly plenty of instances of that we are talking, and, and, uh, and uh, actually in the panel I was reflecting on what both people were saying, we are to some extent in my research experience talking about quite different things. And there is quite a lot of conceptual confusion about the kinds of activities we're talking about. The scale matters because there are very large numbers of people engaged in things that you would regard as tourist activity with some uh, volunteering brand or experience attached to it, in contrast to the kind of things that Kate talking about, which are more within the ICS frame of, if you like, good practice out of the kind of BSO lineage, setting aside some of the baggage that BSO has. So we are we're, we're sort of subsuming some very, very different things into the same kind of discussion. I think it's probably important to separate them out a bit. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of difference between the kind of nine-month um, volunteering placement experience through a structured organization I engaged in one of the research projects than taking a two week or three week trip organized by a commercial company uh, with a badly organized repeated experience. That's precisely the kind of thing I was talking about in Costa Rica. Now, so it, it's important I think to sort of see those in those contexts. I wouldn't regard volunteerism in, in the context of a development debate. I don't, it, it's a commercial activity in the global economy it, it's maybe being presented in a certain way, but I, you know, in, the, in the, the way that I've engaged with it in research terms, I wouldn't include it in a discussion about development other than what is the nature of tourism in a given economy and how much trickle-down is there to the local host community, which is exactly your point about some of the nature of these, these experiences that are notionally volunteering. And this is what I mean about the defining volunteering. We're talking about some very different kinds of things in this discussion already. Jim, you wanted to say uh, yeah, well, just I, I agree with sorry. I agree with the point here that people aren't distorting labour markets in that you know there aren't people there isn't people being employed to do those things anyway. Therein lies the problem. You know, I mean, yeah. poor societies, economically impoverished societies, uh, there isn't the wealth and, and 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 the kind of governance and all the rest of it uh, for, for these these kind of things. And uh, obviously, it requires a, a sort of broad and thoroughgoing and transformative conception of development to conceive of a society that can pay all its own teachers, all its own social workers, 
all its own uh, child minders, you know, all people to dig wells, whatever, whatever uh, it, it is really. So, um, so I kind of, I kind of see there the being a bit of an issue really with, with the way though that in, in that whole debate, lo development is kind of seen as akin to localism, community, uh, immediate benefits. And of course, a lot of development has wider horizons. I mean, if you think about the idea of local development, which nearly all short-term development volunteering kind of goes into, um, by its nature, it is small scale and specific to place. Infrastructure development, which can never be conceived of through volunteering, as far as I can see, links places to other places, village to village, to town, to nation, to the globe. Then you're talking about a wider more thoroughgoing sort of sort of view of development. So it's the way the debate's supposed. One very, very final quick thing. I agree with what Trish has said, especially with regard to the orphanages and children, but I do think there's an issue with referring to host populations as vulner vulnerable. Because I wasn't I, referring to host populations as vulnerable. Okay, I, I, I'm referring to a lot of lot of people who yeah. go away being vulnerable Poor and people. having to go in groups and Okay, okay, I've misunderstood. Like who is but but but, but I think, okay, putting that to one side, I think sometimes, you know, there is, there is a sense that uh, people are kind of vulnerable to the impacts of, of, uh, of short-term development workers. Actually, uh, talking to students, looking at the research on this, I think the response very often to adults in host areas is to take the mick out of them, frankly, not to feel um, oppressed or hard done by by them, but maybe not to take them that seriously. One, one example of this was, uh, there's a guy who's written a book recently about development workers in... Kanhan or Kanhain, I think, in Mozambique. You probably know more about it than I do. Uh, where the local people couldn't actually tell who the tourists were. They thought the tourists were the development workers because the tourists spent money and they benefited from that. And they thought the development workers were the short term and long term. They thought they were the tourists because they stayed in the nice hotels and never spoke to anybody. So, you know, I, I, the, the notion of communities being kind of vulnerable to small numbers of rather meek, wide-eyed development workers. I don't think I'm, although I accept that isn't what you, what you said, but I think it is That's articulated really sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Should we throw the um, panel open to questions? I will take three questions from that lady there. Is there a microphone? No. That lady there with the red dress. And uh, who else? I'll take a couple more. Does anyone else? Uh, the gentleman there with the blue shirt. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, um, my question is, I guess, aimed more at Alex Kent. Um, I'm five weeks back from my three months ICS placement, um, which I don't think is a good idea. Um, but I did it anyway to bulk out my CV for selfish reasons, as I'm a development student. Um, my, my question to you is, how much per head uh, does ICS cost per Western uh, volunteer? And whether you feel that that money is best spent by sending Western volunteers over, or whether that money would be more wisely used. If the community could choose between having that money to spend on a development project or having some untrained uh, young Western people um, come in, which would be the correct, which, which would they choose? And surely we should follow that. Um, again, let's just take another question from the gentleman in the blue shirt. If you just pass the microphone, just grab the mic, and then we'll take both that, those two. Um, mine is directed more towards uh, Dr. Kim Bishop. Um, you mentioned that oh, we can't um, hear you. Can you? With, um, <laughs> so it's green light. <laughs> That's just a shout. Um, yeah, you mentioned that um, it's the Chinese workers doing long term projects that really make it. But when, and when I read science to papers, I find myself agreeing with your perspective. But what would you say to, like, the, um, say when we go and do these kind of things, we are inspired to do long-term projects, and I think that's not very quantifiable, so. Can you use the microphone, please? Um, okay, uh, you said that, um, when you, uh, <laughs> You were Steve. Sorry, do you want to go ahead? Uh, <laughs> um, 
<laughs> you found that the people who really make change are tiny black people. Um, but I would say that uh, I think a bunch of people would agree with me that by having this experience, whether it's a short term or long term thing, it's inspired a bunch of people here, myself included, to do these long term projects. Sure. Lovely. Alex, do you want to go first? <coughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms of cost per head, it's going to be very different, different agencies, different countries, but it is for the ICS the last three years, I think it's 75 million pounds over 20,000 volunteers. So you can kind of work it out for yourself. Um, but in terms of um, in, in terms of what I think, you know, you can do with that money, I, I as I kind of come back to, I think the point about just those three months is missing the point as well about in terms of what you can do and it's not just about the western um going in it's very much about the relationship and it's also about building up the skills in that community it's about the counterpart it's about the relationship between an international volunteer and a national volunteer um i and i think the change that we've definitely seen i'm just to kind of throw some stuff out there is been everything from uh, schools that we've worked in South Africa have written letters, the um, Department of Education has written letters saying thank you so much where your volunteers have been. We've seen a decrease in teenage pregnancies because they've been able to lead those conversations, they've been able to lead that change over a period of time. Um, other things which might happen way beyond the ICS, I mean there's lots of obviously change within the ICS cycle itself, but beyond it, in um, when Ebola struck Sierra Leone, um, we went out to all of our um, volunteers and a lot of them had been previous ICS volunteers and said, do you want to be part of the solution? And actually overnight we had 300 people that came back and said, yes, absolutely. They came back together and they used the same training, the same participatory methodologies that they'd often learned through ICS, you know, teaching people how to do safe sex and other things, um, but with a revised curriculum on, on how to protect yourself from Ebola and how to do safe burials. They went out to the same communities that they had, you know, been um, volunteering during Ebola as well, um, and had already built a trusted relationship and, and in that community. And as a result, some of the places that we volunteered in were the, some of the first places to be declared Ebola free, and it's been continued to be hailed as a huge success in seeing community-led, um, community-led mobilisation that has ended um, uh, Ebola in, in Sierra Leone. So I think that um. The, the after effects, that's just one of many, many examples as well. I think, you know, what you get for ultimately 20,000 volunteers, not only the impact within themselves, but the impact within their communities and the impact on kind of global lasting change, I think is, is quite huge for ultimately 75 million pounds, which is a pretty small amount of the, the overall aid budget. Yeah, on the gentleman's uh, question, I thought he'd only get one. Yeah, that guy had actually three questions there. I'm not sure if others, other people are going to be happy about that, but anyway. Uh, but it's a very, very good question, because I think that is actually what, certainly in, in amongst geographers and, and such like, you know, that's the way people very often uh, see this, that there's a kind of long-term impact on the individual that can spur them and prompt them to think more broadly about development and other issues and act on that throughout their lives. There's a very good study done by Sim one called Simpson, wasn't it? Anyway, Simpson. Kate, Kate Simpson, yeah. yeah. Okay, very, very good. And she, there's lots of really interesting evidence. There's a lot of evidence out there that you can read about w how people have uh, sort of responded to their development. And it, she, she cited this, this case of um, people saying, you know, um, n now, I've play now I've been abroad and done this, you know, I'm a better person when I'm sitting in the office of the NatWest Bank making all these decisions about where money will be invested. And there's one quote in it that she has, I can't quote it precisely, but it's something along the lines of somebody saying, if only some of those executives had been playing football with children on the beach in the Gambia, then they wouldn't make these terrible decisions when they're sitting in an office in, 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 in New York. Now, it seems to me that's wishful thinking, uh, to, put it mild, to put it mildly. However, I'm not decrying what you're saying, because the argument basically is that what, what the process of short-term volunteering contributes to is, is, is global citizenship. That kind of, and that's really the, probably something other people want to talk about and, and comment on as well. Um, but, and it seems to me you know, there's something, something in that, something very, very important about prompting and thinking about our obligations to others, which may be prompted by going to places, seeing how people live, speaking to them. Those things are really good. Interesting thing is, is that from my reading of it, Volunteers come back with all sorts of different impressions when they come back. It's not one, it's not the other, it's not this is good, this is bad, small scales but 
you know, small is beautiful, big is beautiful, all sorts of different things, cynicism, hope, you know, everybody's an individual who goes out there, and I think we, we need to remember that. On the global citizenship, very, very quickly, there is an argument which I have a lot of sympathy with, which is that the notion of citizenship in modern developed countries uh, is problematic. Nobody really trusts politicians, there's not an awful lot of faith in this or that political strategy, notwithstanding recent developments and the Corbyn bounce and everything else. And therefore, what's happened is people have looked to, and societies in a sense with the ICS, have looked to outsource citizenship to the developing world. It's become an arena within which we can establish certain moral credentials, work out a sense of right and wrong, uh, and a sense of mission when that's lacking at home. In the past, possibly, citizenship would have had more of a national dimension through political parties. Uh, through campaigns, through trade unions, uh, that kind of thing. And it, it, you know, to, to a certain extent, the kind of sense of right and wrong through global citizenship has replaced the politics of right and left through national citizenship. And that's, I'm just putting that out as something to uh, think about very finely, of course. Citizenship for people who go abroad uh, and volunteer, volunteer is citizenship for the few. Most people are not going to be able to afford to do this, notwithstanding the... the efforts of, of the ICS and I think that's very very important as well. Great, should we take a couple more questions? The lady down there. Hi, um, yes yeah, so I was um, also an ICS volunteer, um, I was there for quite a while in the end, I was there for nine months um, and my question's for Patricia because I know that you've got a lot of experience in country and uh, speaking to people after development projects. And this is something that Alex uh, touched on. Have you any experience of seeing the aftermath of projects that have worked with in-country volunteers? Because I believe now that's the most important part of the project, or one of the most important parts, the skills that, that are gained just doing that project, if that makes sense. You mean the aftermath? Or for, for the volunteer or for the community? For the in-country volunteers, so volunteers from that country, so Tanzanian volunteers who have taken part in the projects, for example, with British volunteers. OK, I'm going to just take a couple more questions. Um, the lady up at the back there, yep. Um, <clears throat> so this is um, just picking up on um, something that Jim said earlier on. Um, so um, in terms of, uh, it's been mentioned already, in terms of being able to... Um, work for NGOs you have to have quite a substantial amount of experience um, so actually I think a lot of people um, go out to do short-term projects in order to amass that experience um, I, I'm yet to come across an NGO that hasn't asked for it and in fact I'm, I'm a student here at the London School of, um, of Hygiene and I'm uh, I think rightly I, I think that you had to have quite a bit of experience um, or it, it asked for experience um, on your application even so actually a lot of people are going out um, to get that experience so I don't know how you feel about that but I also wanted to comment on the fact that Professor Jones um, mentioned um, actually that we need to kind of maybe divide this um, divide this into um, into different questions um, and actually is this volunteer tourism or is this um, something different is this short-term volunteering or is this volunteer tourism um, and I think that is actually quite a powerful thing because um, because a lot of people are becoming quite inspired just by going out on short-term um, uh, volunteer trips um, to think about their careers long-term um, and therefore feed them back into some of these big organisations such as the WHO or the UN. I'll take one more question from the guy in the stripy T-shirt. Um, so um, I've actually just finished up two years in the Peace Corps. Um, which is a two-year program through the U.S. government, um, and I want my question is regarding government-led schemes such as the Peace Corps and JICA and COICA, which are sort of longer term. So we've mentioned sort of this two-week time frame. We've mentioned a three-month time frame, a nine-month time frame, and Peace Corps is a full two-year time frame. And I wanted to get your opinion uh, both on the difference um, that these longer frame programs versus shorter pr frame programs have, and the nature of government sponsorship. I'm not sure how familiar people are with the Peace Corps, but one of the three goals of Peace Corps is actually very very, very neo-colonialist, um, which is to, you know, make the U.S. look good overseas, and that's the reason why. <laughs> that actually is one of the reasons why it's funded. I used to work on Capitol Hill, and, and when the lobbyists came in, they like that was the talking point, was Peace Corps makes the U.S. look good overseas. Um, so, you know, I'm curious about what your thoughts are on Peace Corps and other government-led schemes, and as well as that time frame. Thank you. Right, who wants to jump in first? 
Jim. Very briefly on the on the first question, th thanks for that. I think that's kind of evidence of this outsourcing of citizenship. You know, you kind of have to go away to learn, uh, uh, you know, those kind of cultural skills and things like that, and those commitments, which possibly in the past would have come through, uh, actually through technical skills and education and a sense of commitment through a political project of the market or socialism of, r of right or left. I don't have any problem with people using trips to get jobs in NGOs. It's the politics of the NGOs that trouble me sometimes. I think that's the issue. Um, on the Peace Corps, very interesting point, and we had a chapter in our book. I've got leaflets here if you want to get a copy later. It's 20% off at the moment for the paper. <laughs> I, 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 told, I said I'd get that in somewhere. That seemed like as good a time as any, really, to, to mention. But there's a really, really good chapter in it. Well, I, I think it's good anyway. <laughs> by myself and Pete, a guy called Pete Smith. Um, about the, the Peace Corps, comparing then and now and what's changed in the whole political scene. A very interesting thing with the Peace Corps is during the Vietnam War, some Peace Corps volunteers got together and wrote a pamphlet criticising their government, which was completely against the ethos of the Peace Corps, which, as you say, in a sense, was part of that sense of mission uh, and American values, a sort of altruistic side to America, you know, in, in that kind, kind of period. I think they got flung out of the Peace Corps. Oh, 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 yeah, you get flung out of the yeah, I mean, I mean, all, also there was the case of was it Nkrumah who, who, uh, or, or I think it was in Nigeria, possibly that Ghana, probably various places. A few, a few Peace Corps volunteers had a hard time being accused of neo-colonialism. But just very, very briefly, there is an interesting contrast still to, to today. I think today is very different. I think in the, the heyday of the Peace Corps, it was part of a kind of coherent uh, sort of narrative of American values. Uh, that was central to politics and political contestation. I think what we have now is something different. We have an absence of political values, an absence of, 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 of national narratives of interest. And actually what we have now is a, not a kind of public politics of, of, of volunteering, but we have a kind of private um, project of the self, which is articulated through going abroad and carrying out these things. After all, it's nearly all done through businesses not through the state. No volunteers that I've heard of come back and say, I was doing this for Britain or for America. Nobody's saying that. In fact, many people are coming back and saying, I learned how unsustainable uh, and consumption oriented my own society is. There's actually a, quite a high degree of self-criticism on the part of volunteers. It doesn't answer your question, but I think there's a big change in the political scene and that shaped the nature of, of volunteering and, and what it kind of means to the individuals uh, and also to societies more generally. Tricia, you want to step in there. Uh, can I come, I'll come back to you? Can I just follow up on, on your question? Um, I think long-term volunteers, um, Peace Corps notwithstanding, can do some fantastic work, and do, uh, especially if they're trained in what they're doing and they can pass those skills over. I think that's absolutely critical, is the passing over of skills. And very often, long-term volunteers are embedded enough in a society to understand it very well at some depth and not in a superficial way, and can often be creative as outsiders in enabling new and innovative things to happen that are beneficial to the society. So yesterday I met with a Kenyan woman, and she had been working on a project in Kenya, an in-house volunteer in Kenya and and she or in country not in house in country in prisons on gender empowerment I'm about gender empowerment folks and gender equality and everything um, and on human rights training prisoners to become lawyers and she told me of the story of one prisoner who has done hugely well and who got out of prison and who had had a death sentence on her through this project, and I said, who initiated the project? And she said, a long-term volunteer who had actually been working in a school, and one of their students' parents had gone into prison, a mother, and he'd followed up and started the, this prison project on human rights and legal training. So long, that was just yesterday. It was very inspiring. And you can get inspiring projects like that all over the place. I could also tell some very wonderful stories people do embed in, and they do pass it on very often, and that becomes entrenched in their whole life. 
So I think, yeah, there's some great stuff that can go on if you're open and if you've got skills to share. You have to have skills to share. Mm -hmm. And as for um, in-country volunteering, there's a story there from just yesterday's meeting with this fabulous woman. And, and you know, we do it here. It's what happens here. We're in-country volunteers, aren't we? And we all learn from our volunteering experiences, some good, some bad, some indifferent. Mm. Um, and the in-country volunteers are working together on a project and they are both sharing skills and they're learning together mm. um, and maybe one volunteer might have more skills than another but the point is through that experience everybody's learning and everybody comes out of that short-term experience mm. a lot better off um, yes. we hope <laughs> well I, I agree with you you know IVS Interval International Voluntary Service and UNA and all these sort of amazing groups that have peace embedded in their values and, and solidarity embedded in their values. When they meet up with other in-country people, then, then they form relationships that last for life and there's a huge amount of sharing and positivity about that. And it can be absolutely fabulous. But the values of the organization are imperative. Andrew, you wanted to say something. Um, I just wanted to come in on, on that because on several of the points made, when I did my research project looking at in-country volunteers and organisations, there was a follow-up point, a uh, follow-up period looking at what around future aspirations around career. There's a very strong correlation in who goes on a structured longer term, maybe nine months, the kind of thing that ICSE is project. I mean, there's people sitting in this room. They're interested in development. They're interested in an international outlook. It is about global citizenship, but if you go into the which may not be so comfortable for you. If you go into the corporate world, the kinds of people you find in, there's a lot of work in my field around who is effective in a transnational corporation or in a transnational organization. These are people with a certain, the psychologists will tell you it's a certain set of outlooks. Guess what, it kind of correlates with the kinds of people who self-select and are interested in, in, they're interested in international travel, but they're also interested in the kinds of experiences we're talking about. And I think it's important to understand the context of the scale of the numbers of those kinds of people, there's lots of them in this room, but in this country there aren't that many of those people. There's a bigger chunk of people uh, getting a tourist experience, maybe they feel they're having that kind of experience and that, to a limited extent. But, but actually the scale of the activity has come back to the question of whether states are funding it. I don't, I don't know whether the state should be funding it, but they're not spending very much money on something that it, the, the, the impact on the volunteer thing shows has a range of quite profound long-term career impacts, regardless of what that career path is. Uh, and that is reflected in the point about who, what NGOs want. They want, there's a homophilous <laughs> point about they want people interested in development who've got experience of being in other countries in that kind of context. So this, this in a utilitarian sense, is supporting in that industry, if we call it an industry, it's supporting that activity in the global in global society. Um, but in terms of the, the longer term thing we've been talking about, we're not talking about very substantial numbers of people. Even if you look at the Peace Corps International Civic Service in the US, the numbers of people engaged in that level of activity. And this pushes me into answering the question of why I think it's a positive thing. In my wider kind of engagement with globalization, the planet having more people who've got an understanding of intercultural issues and have experience of being in different places, given that most people don't or have only mediated understanding of what's going on on the rest of the planet through televised media or the internet, is probably a good thing. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Alex, did you? Um, yeah, just quickly. Um, I don't know much about Peace Corps, so I can't comment on that um, particularly. But it's interesting what you're saying about, you know, one of the principles being about this is actually, um, it, you know, promoting the US and I, and I, it really concerns me because I think that is our direction of travel in the UK as well and I think in terms of our the UK aid and how we want to increasingly spend the UK aid it's going to be increasingly about uh, British concerns and what's best for UK and you know you spending that in terms of increasing our trade um, and that's yeah in a combination of uh, public rhetoric in terms of um, politically what the direction of travel so it'll be interesting whether that does kind of have an effect on our increasingly on volunteering and absolutely 
that isn't about good quality volunteering. Good quality volunteering has to be led by the community. It has to be, you know, those the priorities have to be led by the community. It needs to be in partnership. It needs to be with the kind of absolute, the, the priorities being driven from there. So I just think that's an absolute key one that we need to defend as well. And I think we've kind of probably got a, a right to kind of defend that um, through. Um, and just to come up to your, your point um, on, 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 I guess, on, on using it to, to work for NGOs, I, I guess the one thing in ICS's favour is actually it isn't for the few and for the privileged. There are, it is open um, to anyone. There are diversity targets, unlike before, I guess, when any kind of like international volunteering opportunities, yeah, you had to be pretty rich and um, privileged to be able to, to be able to volunteer overseas. And I guess the really nice, exciting thing about ICS is it is very much open um, and changes, you know, huge um, um, potential and, and at, at scale. Um, and just to say that um, rest is to, and I, I also agree with some of the kind of the, the problems with actually the development sector and, and, and how we work. And I think we're constantly trying to challenge ourselves to do better at that. So we recruit on potential. You don't need to have overseas experience to work for rest is development. Um, and we don't take um, unpaid interns and we advocate for others to do exactly the same to make sure that we are trying to increase, you know, increasingly get a diverse, um, a totally open, accessible and so that anyone can ultimately work in development. Jim, want to just add one more thing? Yeah, just to point on the community of, re of community, uh, sorry, the rhetoric of community, which is everywhere you look, you know, put community in the front of something and it sounds very fluffy and nice and everything like that. And of course, on one level, community should come first, etc. But nations are communities too, and nations are sovereign, and nations are the principal political unit uh, in the world in which we live. And there is a fear sometimes that projects that are constantly, constantly relating to small community here, small community there and there, actually miss the whole kind of national uh, level of development and, in a sense, potentially undercut the notion of sovereignty, which is so important. I have completely neglected you guys over here. So would you like to ask a question? And you want to ask a question, and the lady with the black jumper there. Thank you. Um, I completely agree with what with what a lot of the panel has said um, about the the positive and the negative impacts on both community and the individual in terms of short term volunteering. And it's interesting what uh, Alex was saying just now about the issue of internships uh, being paid or unpaid. And I wonder what the panel thinks about uh, this huge amount of uh, unpaid cheap or very cheap labour coming from volunteers, how that impacts or encourages the culture of unpaid internships, which is generally the case uh, in development, whereby people studying this are not only expected to pay for their education, but then expected to pay for their uh, training as well, because it's very difficult to find internships that are paid. So um, thanks for all the points from the panel and the audience. I think I think um, a few people from the audience brought up that the people who are undertaking these um, study abroad three to four weeks, they have a lot of development and they inspire themselves a lot. However, I'd also like to bring out that when they do go on these expeditions, they tend to put pictures and media online and it tends to inspire others too. So maybe um, have you thought about that as well? And um, this is a question to Trisha. Um, Trisha, you said that you seem to be fine with the longer two-year Peace Corps type volunteering. However, do you think that the short-term, maybe ICS or even shorter-term three to four-week placements maybe push people who probably at first wouldn't commit to a longer-term volunteering scheme? And then again, um, as Andrew said, um, you you think that this should have a changed title from volunteerism to short term volunteering? So then again, to Trisha, do you think that all short term volunteering per se is bad, or just how it is enacted at the moment? Because um, I understand you did say stuff about um, when people pay a thousand pounds, only a little pro proportion of that actually goes to to the families. Um, and then sorry for for another question. Um, this question is actually. Um, to Alex, and you mentioned about um, 
the elimination of Ebola in Sierra Leone and you put it down to the short term volunteering that was there. Do you think that this is like slightly on the side of wishful thinking to think that a few weeks or months um, contributed to the elimination of diseases and a few months of untrained volunteers going there? That was a lot of questions. That's way more okay. than I'm, I'm going to try to be very brief. Uh, I have one question for Andrew. You just mentioned earlier that um, you. We, we need to be clear with the definition of development and probably short-term volunteering doesn't fit really much into the development debate. But my question is then, how do you make sure that you're not creating parallel system? If we're talking about health, for example, there's a lot of different programs that don't really speak to each other or um, integrate within the health system. And that can be really harmful for the, for the health of the population ultimately. So that's qu one question I have for you. And um, the one that I have for Alex is just how do you measure the impact that you have on communities? Because I feel that we hear a lot that we need to work with communities. It needs to be community led, but how do you make sure it's the case? I personally don't believe that if you are a 20 years old person who comes from wherever in the West, have absolutely no skills and not always altruistic, because I think it can also be uh, a nice experience that you can, um, you know, that you think that will make you a better person and share on social media just to promote yourself. How do you make sure that, you know, these people can, can have, can have a, a positive impact on communities? What do they say about it? Thank you very much. So I'd love you to all keep your answers really, really short because then we can run, squeeze in one more round of questions because there are obviously a lot of people with questions. So who, Andrew's got in there first. <laughs> I'll go very quickly. I'm not, I'm not sure I understood your question, but on the length of time, and this reflects the findings actually of the Gapier report for DFE, and this is what I also think, in terms of a debate about the development impact, right, and we've got a wide set of issues around what it does to individuals, careers, their lives, the world, but in terms of the development impact for very short term volunteering, it is very difficult in my research experience for organisations of any form, in fact we're talking about two or three weeks, to, for to structure an experience that has uh, is tremendously effective. And if you think of it in a cost-benefit analysis, the cost of somebody flying somewhere for two weeks just in carbon emissions and their, the amount of money they're spending via V, what's actually, what they can possibly do in that time. The one exception to that may be in this kind of point as you raise in terms of health. So interaction, there's a lot of positive impacts in interaction. ICS has an impact evaluation, but it's very hard to understand the long-term impact of things that could be over decades uh, 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 in terms of a positive shift in, in, in global society. As you go out in that length of time, what, what my, my own experience is, it really matters that we, we get into this territory where we're talking about months in terms of an exper a work experience or a volunteering experience. So that, that, that's easier to establish in the way we've talked about. The one thing I want to say, just to add into the debate, it really matters what type of activity we're talking about. We're talking about volunteering as if all these things are the same. 500 people standing on a beach in Costa Rica to stop some turtles being taken by the seagulls when they need three is not a good use of anybody's time or resources. Um, actually, the teaching language assistance is a work experience with a co-volunteer in Huntry. It's, you know, as my Tanzanian head said, this is not, you know, this is not the profoundest thing in development, but it's a perfectly good, uh, you know, activity. It's, it's lower level work. I value having these people for cultural reasons. Uh, if we're talking about other kinds of more targeted experiences, then they can have considerably greater impact. VSO for years were posting doctors in places. So it really matters what we're talking about when we say volunteering. What the activity is is hugely important, and we mustn't treat all these activities as the same. Thank you. Tricia. One of the most horrible things that I ever had to do at Tourism Concern was brief the Tory party at Tory headquarters, including David Cameron. <laughs> Um, twice, um, no Boris, a group of party uh, MPs and prospective MPs who wanted to do two weeks volunteering in Rwanda and I had to brief them and, and it, you know, you can imagine. You know. And afterwards one of the women said to me she'd never been spoken to like that in her life. <laughs> and and um, a year later, they invited me to an event at the House of Commons 
where they showed the photographs and talked about what they'd done. And and I'd said, do, you know, one little thing where I said, you know, do be careful what you wear, because I know what you wear is incredibly important to people in Rwanda. As it is to people all over the world, please don't wear shorts and T-shirts and things like that, because the Rwandans like to dress nicely. And all that sort of stuff, and there's all these photographs of shorts and T-shirts. But um, I really believe, because they went back again, and this time they weren't painting um, schools, which was somebody else's job. But the next time they sent back lawyers and doctors, and they did training. And I was also involved in campaigning for 0.7% of development um, money from this country to go overseas. And guess who brought that in? It was David Cameron and co. So I do see that short-term volunteering, and they can p continue to go back to Rwanda, uh, doctors and lawyers and people who can train for short-term. Um, and it's been, you know, and like, hey, wow. Not just because, I don't mean just because of me, but I'm just saying that th th that happened. So there can be positive benefits, um, especially if you are in a position of decision making. Um, yeah. Jim. I'll pass on that one. Okay, Alex. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks. So uh, the first one on um, on impact, there's lots of different ways um, to measure it. So obviously in, in terms of the placement itself, so depending on what the project is, and, and ICS has a huge diversity of the things that people work on, um, and, it, and it could be from a percentage of increased confidence, such as being able to negotiate self, um, safe sex, so self-reporting on that, or a percentage of um, people that have been able to um, increase, uh, get interviews, or um, have CVs, or job openings. Um, and then there's also actually if people haven't seen it it's um, because I think there is a there's a lack of research on this as well so the IDS did the valuing volunteering so there's lots of really great stuff in there as well about how you can measure the relationship and the importance of the relationships which come out from volunteering which is really unique and it's different from other development um, projects and, and the impact that can have but I think it just, I just want to come back to my, my point again is which is I think if by focusing on impact we're missing the point and I feel like that's one of the biggest problems with our, with development and where we're going at the moment. Yes, we need to develop, we need to do impact, but we, but by focusing on, on impact and pushing it into a log frame, we're also stepping back from this much bigger global change that we have, we need to see, we need to see it at a much bigger scale and a much, uh, much greater rate. And I think there's a huge potential there and how we measure it, I'm not an expert, I'd love to grapple with with it and, and definitely open up that, that up to others to, to, to bring into that. But I think we do need to see that much wider um, impact and, and at, um, change at a much larger, longer term scale. And I guess coming on to your point about Ebola, sorry, I, I'm not saying the three month alone um, that, that has ended Ebola, absolutely not. But however, the community led um, actions in, uh, in Sierra Leone especially was um, a huge impact in terms of reducing and, and ending um, Ebola. There's lots of there's lots of evidence that has shown that, um, and there's yeah there's kind of like big testimonies from the government as well. So, in terms of how it worked with with volunteers that some of them had done ICS, not all of them had. Other ones had done other types of volunteering, um, and increasingly through them and through wider networks would come and they would do, they would do, the young people would do trainings, they would learn how to protect themselves, but also how to go out and, and learn, teach others how to protect themselves, how to do um, safe hand washing, safe burials, and every time someone died, there would be a little treat team that got together and, and actually put everything into action. So you saw community change at a much faster, much faster rate and a much faster scale than other ways. I mean, other UK aid methods, <laughs> was also spent on putting posters up um, in across across the area Leone saying UK aid, you know, Ebola kills. I just, I mean, the, the difference and obviously the, the amount of money that we spent on that as well as, you know, crack teams and going in and, in terms of tanks, whereas actually just working with local community-led volunteers in terms of the, the, the scope and the breadth of change is, is phenomenal. So I think it is definitely something that kind of needs to give point. Um, and I guess the, just the the point on input and paid interns, I totally agree with what you said. 
yeah, absolutely. We need to change the way development works. We need to change who's running it. We need to make sure that that's open. Then we need to make sure that's accessible to anyone. Um, and I think there's a huge part we play in making sure that you know people aren't out of pocket. You shouldn't have to be out of pocket. You know, after after all that. And as you say, you know, pay for your own training. No, absolutely. You know, the whole idea is that you know it should be based on potential. Um, it's not about yeah where you come from and if you've got the resources or. Um, the privilege beforehand and I think you know we've got a really valuable play role to play in terms of turning it around. So I'm going to take two more questions and then we've got to stop. So this guy here and somebody, the lady in the grey jumper over there. <laughs> <laughs> totally random. Do you want to? Um, I would like simply to ask the panel their opinion on reparations to ex-Commonwealth and ex-colonies of this country and other empirical powers. Mm. And do they see the topic of reparations as uh, relevant to the development debate first and foremost, and secondly, as a way of uh, restitution or apology in supporting um, ex-colonial, ex-subjects of colonialism to redress that historical imbalance? I, I don't know if, that, if that's what we... I mean, I think that's a really valid discussion, and maybe that's one for the next debate. I don't know. Is that part of this conversation? I don't know. Do you think that's part of the conversation I about I mean, I mean, I don't, I, I, I mean, I'll leave the panel to decide if they want to answer the question, because um, I, I don't want to get into a massive... Because we've got... Well, we've got minus seven minutes now. <laughs> so is that, is that okay? We'll leave the panel to decide. But I'm just putting on record that I'm not... I think that's a great discussion to have next time. <coughs> and I'd like that note down. But I'm not sure it's part of this. And the lady in the grey jumper over there. Yeah, thank you. I just would like to remind one fact about the nature of volunteering and uh, outline why I believe that short-term volunteering is absolutely crucial. It is because I'm sure most of us here and basically in the international environment of volunteering can relate to that, us short-term volunteers initially, when we go somewhere on spot, we believe that we're going there for two weeks, for one week, for months, whatever our contract is, and then we stay. We stay there, we keep coming back, and this is where work keeps going, and this is how we make an impact. Thank you. Okay, I'll take one more question. Um, the lady at the back with the blue scarf, uh, miles from any microphone, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Can I pass that along? Hi, um, my question is generally to the to all of the panel, uh, we've talked a lot about younger people going when they're 18, 19, with not a lot of experience and all the factors. I'm going to take it to the complete other end of spectrums and talk about people that have a very, very Pacific skill set. And I'm talking about physicians in Pacific. There's a huge trend within the medical world to go and do these one week missions. Um, having been at the receiving end for the last two to three years and hosting these teams, I think even these people who are highly skilled, very, very good at what do, I think their impact factor is near to nothing. And I would argue that actually, even in a group that is so skilled, coming for one week is, I don't know, with all that money on flights and accommodation and everything, if you take a doctor from one hospital here in London and put him in the other hospital, I can tell you he will panic. And you're taking one person from this country and putting them on the other. And frequently, most of these people have actually never worked in a resource limited setting. Um, so I, th I, I think it's a bit more than just having a skill set that defines an impact or it's actually beneficial. And I'm just wondering what your, what your opinion is. Um, I don't know if you deal with older people. <laughs> Professional people. <laughs> Great, Trisha, you start off, and and these are going to be last answers, I'm afraid, guys. Thank you very much. So, so if you want to wrap up with anything else, any other brilliant thoughts that have occurred to you? I feel a bit bold over the idea that people can go out for one week somewhere. I didn't even know that happened, and I, I just want to say that I'm just so sorry that we're all, you know, people from Britain sitting here, you know, white, middle class, whatever, and. And when we had our debate, we had, you know, it wasn't us sitting here, it was others, you know, saying what they thought because they were at the receiving end. And if you're at the receiving end, I go with what you say. And I think it's truly, deeply shocking that people are almost arrogant enough to think that one week is enough, you know? Hey. 
Um, in a similar way, just to come on that point, it's what it's what I said before. I don't think it's impossible that you could have some kind of uh, skill people beneficial experience, but it's it's improbable, as you say. So it is very difficult to have an impactful short term experience. Uh, and also, I wanted to add in a more general point about the difference between volunteering or voluntary work and experience, because we are conflating the two in the discussion we've had. And lots of the lots of the things, inspiration, uh, there is much positive impact in people being inspired, in thinking about their careers, um, in having experiences, and, and that's sort of one category, uh, and there are justifications in terms of the, the nature of the experience, how it's structured, how long it might be. Now, obviously, you can have an experience in a shorter period of time. When we get into volunteering, for me, volunteering is talking about some kind of something that in a sociological sense resembles work. It's much harder in a shorter term, even for doctors. It's easier than for skilled people, and VSO knew this for years. They, they didn't engage with young people actually for the longest period, VSO, rightly or wrongly. They focused on professionals in longer term placements. So that's this particular space. I think, to, I didn't answer the question properly before, in certain areas, so I can, I can see in a well-structured scheme certain types of medical training being provided for two, four weeks by people who know what they're doing, that really could be impactful. So it very, very much depends, even within subcategories, of what type of activity it is and how the thing is organised. The, the, and particularly if you're going to deliver something that is work, then that requires quite a lot of circumstances around it for that to be effective. But coming back to the very short-term volunteerism, my final point, Right, the, 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 it is possible to imagine, I said before, you know, it's very difficult and volunteerism is, for me, in a, probably warrants being in a different category. It's possible to imagine in development terms, in the wider discussion about tourism, a volunteerism of some form being positive, well-structured, in a way that is financially beneficial for communities wherever the, that tourism is taking place. And that is part of the bigger debate about tourism. In a sense, it's got a, a little bit of a volunteeristic experience. I think a lot of practice that exists is, uh, is it's questionable whether that is the case. Uh, but it's not impossible. So it really matters in terms of the specific type of the activity. But I, I would emphasize as a sort of final thing about where it is well organized, or well conceived, and well managed, involving in a collaborative way wherever people are going to, then those are the indicators of effective impact. Uh, but it, 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 we are talking about something that is on a huge spectrum of, of different types of activity. Lovely, thank you. Jim, what would you like to say? On the, on the thing about the nursing and the one week, you know, the nitty gritty of how things work, I'm an academic, so I don't know anything about the real world, so I can't, re <laughs> I, I, I can't really address that question. But I want to make a slightly different point that I think is pertinent uh, to that, really. It seems to me, to take a step back a little bit from this debate, that if you follow discussions about tour let's, tourism, for example, uh, apparently now all, all tourism has to be about development. It's all supposed to be ethical tourism, whether, you, whether you're going to the beach or working in a community. Ethical tourism is pushed very, very hard uh, as, as a kind of norm with a nod towards uh, development, community tourism, ethical tourism, green tourism, and all the rest of it. And then if you look at the development side of things, there's been a kind of strand of thinking in rural development thinking which has stressed a sort of neo-populist, community-oriented, uh, Robert Chambers-inflected, pasta-stick, patronising nonsense. Um, uh, and actually making also, you know, development thinking that also makes a virtue sometimes of a lack of expertise. You know, come without your own ideas because you don't really have any because you're Western. So, so these two trends meet in the middle. On the one hand, the tourist trying to do good and the development worker trying to relate. And that's where we are with this, really, a conflation of two very, very different things. I'd like to see the two in discussions and, and politically separated out a little bit more so that, so that tourism and exploration and discovery and altruism was one thing. But development was a slightly different discussion uh, of slightly greater sort of import in, 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 in some respects related to sort of transformative, technologically oriented and skilled uh, and all the rest of it, uh, em emphasis. Um, I'd really like to see... I don't know too much about the, the ICS, but what I think would be a really good idea for the British government would be to put money into proper reciprocal exchanges, whereby, for example, and I know this happens, and I know probably the government fund it and other charities do it, 
whereas schools here can match up with schools elsewhere, send some of their students there and get some of their students from the other countries to come back. Because that would make for a kind of equality of experience, if you like. And it also, students would learn a lot, not just from the exchange, but from the intense difficulty of getting the students from Africa or Asia through customs, immigration, to see them. And they would learn a very, very good political lesson from that, never mind the effective and altruistic lesson that they would learn, learn otherwise. On your reparations, I'm against it for the same reasons as Franz Fanon. You don't look back, you look to the future and fight for, and don't identify problems in the present as a legacy of wrongdoings in the past. But it's a really interesting point that we can't do just as soon now. Um, I, uh yeah, no, I, I agree in mean, what you were just saying about the if you could kind of partner up in terms of schools and see something go the other way, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen anytime soon. I just think actually in terms of where our, our money is being spent, in terms of what's happened in terms of a development education budget, in terms of, you know, being able to to be able to spend um, any kind of UK money or UK aid on anything like that in terms of being able to get people into this country is not our direction of travel and I think we do have a role to continue to kind of like actually be really open and honest about that. I think there is a really dangerous rhetoric that's happening in the Daily Mail and it's only going in one direction and we need to be really protecting it um, and loud but it would be great if it, if it could happen. Um, uh, in terms of young people, I'm not going to apologise for talking about that. I work for a youth organisation, so that's what I do. So, um, and it, that is our focus, and, and so that, that's where, where my take is coming from. Um, I just like, and I, I can comment on in terms of the, the kind of the, the timing or the placement. Um, I just want to kind of challenge two things, which is one is about the, you know, we've talked about the, the short term volunteering, whether that's one week or three months or 24 months, or, um, and I think there is a, there's a, you know the impact is usually much much longer both in terms of the communities I gave a couple of examples but also in terms of the individuals I can definitely speak for myself in terms of what's happened in terms of my career um, path that I've chosen um, uh, a different Jon Snow not this one the Jon Snow that's on your television um, you know volunteered when he was 18 and, and talked a lot about how that's continued to shape what he's gone on to do Louis through volunteered with the rest of his development when he was um, at the beginning of his path as well and then loads of um, our, our volunteers have gone on to be country directors including our, our Southern Africa um, lead who now leads all of our global programs she started her career by volunteering in her local community in Kabwe in, in Lusaka um, and I've got Got many many other examples of that so one I think there's something about just the kind of short-term volunteering um, and actually the impact goes on for much longer than that but also the beyond that individual at a much bigger scale is as well um, you know ICS has worked with at least 30,000 volunteers over the last five years the impact on obviously those individuals but also their communities their networks and a much globe and on much bigger scale has been profound whether it's been leading accountability projects on sdgs and, and i could go into a lot more, much more detail but i just want to kind of break down some of this it's just about that box it's not it's much much bigger than that thank you all so much for coming for brilliant and very very searching questions that have challenged everybody on the panel and made us ask some, um, let's try to answer some difficult and yeah, sometimes occasionally slightly needly questions. Um, thank you very much to the panel.